Hello, my name is Dr. Bridget Nash, and I'd like to welcome you to The Therapy Show, a podcast series that seeks to demystify mental health treatment. Today, I'm honored to welcome Dr. John Oldham, who is the Distinguished Emeritus Professor of Psychiatry in the Menninger Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences at Baylor College of Medicine. Dr. Oldham specializes in the field of personality disorders and is recognized internationally as a leader in psychiatric medicine, receiving numerous awards and honors. Nationally, he has served psychiatric organizations in many capacities during his career, including as past president of the American Psychiatric Association and past president of the American College of Psychiatrists. A prolific writer and educator, Dr. Oldham is the senior editor of the textbook of personality disorders, which is now in its second edition. He is also the editor of the Journal of Personality Disorders and joint editor-in-chief of Borderline Personality Disorder and Emotion Regulation. Dr. Oldham, welcome to The Therapy Show. Thank you, Bridget. It's wonderful to be here. I appreciate the opportunity. Can you start by telling us a little bit about your personal background and professional development that led to your research in the field of personality disorders? Uh, sure. I'll try to cover a long career and a brief summary. I actually ended up in medical school after starting out, uh, not totally sure which direction I wanted to go, but I went to Baylor Medical School in Houston and then decided to go into psychiatry and moved to New York, where I stayed for about 30 years. But I got my psychiatry training, and in those days, you almost always got psychoanalytic training as well. So I got both uh, of those types of training at Columbia in New York. And that's really where the roots and the early interest in personality and personality development began for me. In those days, there was a strong interest in character development, sort of in the lived experience, how to understand human behavior, what makes us tick, how to understand why things go right for some people and things go wrong for other people. This was really even before we had developed a sort of common endorsement of something called the biopsychosocial model for psychiatric and brain disorders. And that's a model that we use extensively now, really, which spells out that there's a biological component to both of our normal behavior as well as abnormalities when they happen. And that can include a genetic component. And then a psychological component, which is really how we're alike and how we're different, what kind of predictable patterns of behavior are typical for one person, but not for another. Some people can be reserved. We might call them introverted. Others can be outgoing. We might call them extroverted. Others can be resilient. Others can be vulnerable. And we'll get more into that later when we talk about the range of personality traits and even personality disorders. But I got very interested in this. And the third component of the biopsychosocial model is what is the social environment like? in which you grew up and which surrounds you during your lifetime, because that social environment, including your socioeconomic status, your cultural status, can be a major influence in terms of what your personality profile ends up looking like. It's an interest that had its roots in those early ways of thinking. One of my supervisors was a wonderful pioneer in the area of personality disorders, his name is Dr. Otto Kernberg, and actually he's still going strong. He runs a unit studying personality at Cornell New York Hospital in New York. After I finished my training, I had the lucky opportunity to go and work at the Westchester Division of New York Hospital, where he was medical director. And in those days, he was studying in particular a condition called borderline personality disorder. And we can get back into that a little bit later and talk a little bit about what that disorder is, because it's one that is really important and fairly prevalent in clinical treatment areas. So I got interested in that and was able to join with some colleagues and lead some of his early research studying borderline personality disorder. And then a few years later, I relocated to Columbia and the New York Psychiatric Institute in Manhattan. And there, we were able to set up what we called a unit for personality studies. And with some colleagues, I was able to join in a collaborative longitudinal personality disorder study, which was funded by the National Institute of Mental Health. And that turned out to be a multi-site longitudinal study that was funded by NIMH for over 15 years. 
which was a wonderful database. And it's one that similarly had been done previously, uh, looking at people with depression and another one looking at people with schizophrenia. And these are longitudinal studies where you have a set of standardized regular interval revisit interviews with the patients over multiple years, then have a way to establish how people do over time with these particular conditions. So that was something that, uh, again, just I was lucky to be a part of and reinforced my interest in personality and personality disorders. And that has been very persistent and been an area that I've become more and more interested and involved in throughout my career. So how would you briefly explain personality disorders to a non-professional? Let's start with personality itself. What do we mean when we say, what is somebody's personality? And it's pretty self-evident, but it's a characteristic pattern of thinking, acting, and feeling. But it's also a unique combination of traits, and that's different from one person to another. You could kind of think about it as a behavioral fingerprint. Fingerprints are unique, but we know what we mean when we say fingerprints. So it's a set of sort of predictable behaviors and emotions and thinking patterns that is typical for each of us. And yet, it's different from one person to the next. As I mentioned before, you can have extremes that would be very different, such as an extrovert or an introvert, meaning an outgoing person or somebody who is more reserved. And to some degree, it's a way of thinking and feeling and behaving, to some degree hardwired, and it's inborn. So it's a dimensional mix of personality traits that you have a contribution from your genetic heritable components that then combines with how that early pattern then gets further developed and shaped based on your environment, your developmental experiences, how much you have a supportive, stable environment, whether you have a lot of trauma, whether you have a lot of destabilizing, unfortunate experiences. All of that will be very important in leading to a pattern of adult personality. So what I'm shifting to is from personality itself to what we call personality disorders. Then you have to think about how do we conceptualize what a disorder is compared to what somebody's normal personality range of behavior and behavior traits would be. What I often use is talking to people, I say, let's think of it like blood pressure. Use a blood pressure model. Everybody's got to have blood pressure in order to be human and be alive. You could sort of replace blood pressure with the word personality. Everybody's going to have a personality. That's part of being human. But as with blood pressure, too much or too little of a necessary thing can become a problem. So I think if you keep that in mind, it's kind of extremes on either end of what we would call a kind of a normal range of personality types uh, that can become a problem. I often talk about a dimensional system and what are the differences between dimensional and what we call categorical systems. Well, dimensional concepts are fairly commonly used to describe different kinds of things like weight and height. These are dimensional constructs so that there's no big gap anywhere along the spectrum. It's all the way from very low to very high and a set of steps in between. Whereas a categorical system is something that is sort of defined, has a space all of its own, isn't sort of continuous with other things. And a good examples of that would be being male, being female, being pregnant. These are conditions and they're defined and specific and you have one of these conditions or you don't. In medicine, we always use a categorical system, and that's used all across medicine in terms of surgery and internal medicine and all specialties, where we have a disorder such as asthma or diabetes or heart disease or cancer, and there are many, many different varieties of each of these categories, but we think categorically. We've done that traditionally in psychiatry as well. So we have bipolar disorder, we have major depressive disorder, we have an anxiety disorder, and we have a personality disorder. And so traditionally in our official diagnostic manual called the DSM, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, we have listed categories of disorders and one major grouping is the personality disorders. And then there is a list of each of the disorders and there's been a slight variation on the number that were thought to be valid from one edition of the diagnostic manual to another. 
but in the most recent, which is the DSM-5, which was published in 2013, in the main diagnostic section, there are 10 listed disorders. Now, those disorders are defined by certain criteria, and the criteria reflect pathological personality traits or specific types of behavior that are typical of somebody with a particular disorder. So, personality disorder is a combination of traits that add up to a condition that begins to lead to what we call significant impairment in functioning. There's significant distress, enormous challenges in terms of usually reaching your life goals, even knowing what your goals are, being able to effectively carry out your career, move toward goals that you want for yourself, and in your ability to relate to other people. So one thing, let me just pause for a minute and and clarify. So what I've said so far is that personality types, it's a wonderfully just enriched area to study that I've really benefited from and enjoyed in my career. Colorful pageant of the variations in personality types and how people are different and what types of people fit together as life partners or don't and what kinds do better in one particular type of employment versus another career is a really interesting area. And there's a lot in the psychology literature and that it's been studied through the general normal populations. We got interested, a group of us, in trying to do a revision of the personality disorder section. And a good friend of mine, Andrew Skodel, who was a colleague at Columbia for many, many years, was asked to chair the work group by the American Psychiatric Association on personality and personality disorders. And I co-chaired that group that developed a new model. It's called the Alternative Model for DSM-5 Personality Disorders. We shorthand that to say the AMPD. And that's in the third section of the book, which is the section called Emerging Measures and Models. Now, the reason I go there is because we tried to step back and to think once again, like I was talking about a few moments ago, what are the elements of normal personality? And looked at the literature, and there's a pretty strong case to be made that there are two main ingredients to anybody's personality. One is a sense of self. Who am I? And another is one's interpersonal relationships. How do I get along with other people? How do I relate to other people? And we felt that each of those could be subdivided into two components. So a sense of self consists of one's identity. That's the who am I part. Do I know who I am in the world? Do I know where my sense of self ends and somebody else's begins? That may sound self-evident, but there are people who are confused about that and not clear about that. And the second component is called self-direction. Do I know where I'm going? What are my goals? Do I have short-term goals and long-term goals? Do I have an effective way and a clear way to set those goals and then work toward them? Interpersonally, we subdivide it into empathy and intimacy. And empathy, we're all pretty familiar with that term these days. That is the capacity to really see the world through somebody else's eyes. At the Menninger Clinic, we talk about mentalization as a kind of a template or a framework to understand each other and our behavior. And the shorthand way to think about that is having a capacity to see yourself from the outside and somebody else from the inside. So empathy is really being able to put yourself in someone else's shoes and try to see the world through that person's eyes based on imagining having had that person's lifetime experiences, imagining being that person. And that's an enormously wonderful trait to be able to help you not sort of misunderstand someone else because you have certain strong beliefs, like you think people should be the way you think they should be, and you don't then understand how different somebody else may think and see the world. Finally, intimacy doesn't refer to a romantic condition, but rather it refers to a capacity for and a desire for closeness with others that can be lasting over time and that's mutually gratifying. So we thought these were really, this is a good framework to think about normal personality functioning. And then when we thought about, go back to that blood pressure model, the extremes, how would that look? 
And so the essential features of a personality disorder using this model are moderate or greater impairment in personality functioning, by which we mean functioning in the self and interpersonal domains, plus the presence of one or more pathological personality traits. And I'll tell you a little bit more about what we mean by pathological personality traits, but in essence, it's personality traits that have become extreme and therefore get in your way and don't serve to help you function in the world. So we have criterion A, which is moderate or greater impairment in self or interpersonal functioning, and then patterns of pathological personality traits. And we have five trait domains that have kind of fancy names. One's called negative affectivity. That means you're just pretty sour and negative in your attitude and feelings across lots of areas. Detachment, that means you're sort of disconnected and not able to interact and relate to people very well. Antagonism, you tend to be pretty prickly and hostile, and so much so that it doesn't work to your benefit. Disinhibition, that really means you can be impulsive, and impulsive to the degree you act on impulse in a way that doesn't work for you. And then the final domain is called psychoticism, which means that you don't quite stay on track in terms of the reality of the world, and you get a little bit eccentric and maybe off the beaten path. We do have we have retained a set of labeled personality disorders that are similar to the ones uh, in the previous editions of the DSM. And one is called antisocial, one is called avoidant, one is called borderline, one is called narcissistic, one is called obsessive compulsive, and one is called schizotypal. So those are patterns of pathology that are characterized, as I said, by moderate or greater impairment in functioning and some pathological traits. So that's a very long-winded answer to your question, but let me take a break there and see what else you'd like me to talk about. So what are some examples of impairment in functioning? Let me pick up on what I earlier mentioned, the condition called borderline personality disorder, and talk a little bit about that. Because that's a condition is fairly common. It's very, very disabling and distressing to the person who has it and challenging and distressing to families of people with this condition, and even to people in the health profession who are trained to work with people but trying to help them is a challenge. So why is something called borderline personality disorder? Well, the term actually came from the days when we thought this condition looked like what we used to call kind of neurotic conditions, which were mostly conditions characterized by a lot of anxiety and and mood pathology. And this was a condition on the border between that and more serious conditions that we call the psychotic dimension. So borderline disorders were thought to be almost the healthier neurotic pathology, but really tilting toward the more ill psychotic capacity. Now, it turns out that when we really define the criteria for this condition and the criteria for others, the condition, the personality disorder that really is on the border of psychosis, we call schizotypal personality disorder. But the borderline label had stuck. However, I think it's still quite useful. And I say to families, look, your family member has a condition called borderline, and it's called borderline because it's on the border of being a major mood disorder or being a major impulse control disorder. That really helps people understand why it's called borderline, and it also specifies and tunes in to some of the key pathology and key distress looks like in people with this condition. And the two really are sometimes called heritable risk factors or endophenotypes, to use a fancy word, or emotion dysregulation and impulsivity or sometimes impulsive aggression. And these are two characteristic types of behavior. So in somebody with borderline personality disorder, there's a predisposition, an inborn risk to develop this condition. doesn't mean somebody with that risk is going to necessarily develop the disorder itself, just as we have lots of things that run in families in all of medicine, such as diabetes and heart disease, cancer, asthma, immune conditions. We have risk factors We don't necessarily become ill with those conditions, but we might be at a little bit higher percent chance than the average person in the population. That's true for these conditions just as well. But if you do develop borderline personality disorder, 
then you have a series of pretty predictable types of behavior. If you think about it in terms of the alternative model that I just mentioned, you don't have a very good sense of yourself. Your identity is confusing. You don't really have a clear way to say, this is who I am and this is what I believe. Sometimes people with this condition are so confused about that, they will admire somebody and then try to be like that person and say, this is who I am, but it's really a carbon copy imitation of somebody else because they don't really have a good sense of themselves. They don't have an ability to plan their lives in a systematic and effective way, and they don't have a good capacity for empathy. They can't get out of their own skin and put them themselves in somebody else's shoes to try to understand that person because they're so really distressed and in turmoil internally. And that leads to a real problem in making lasting, meaningful, rewarding relationships with other people. So with families and with therapists and with friends, people with this condition are so anxiety-ridden and can be so easily destabilized that it becomes very difficult to figure out how to stay helpful to these people. They're very thin-skinned. Any little thing will set them off. And then they are in such distress that they just can't turn it off. And no matter what reassurance you provide, it doesn't really do the job. I'll just mention one other example here. Sometimes when I'm talking to families, I will say, look, we know that people with the risk for this condition probably have, and we've seen this from neurobiology brain imaging studies, that there's a sort of faulty, not very strong nerve connection between the emotion center of the brain, which is called the limbic center. It's a deep center of the brain and what we call the prefrontal cortex. You can think of that part of the exterior part of the brain and the front of the brain as the kind of thoughts and behavior traffic controller. So the problem is that people with this condition have a double hit. First hit is that they are wired in such a way that they're hyper-reactive emotionally. Any little thing will set them off. They'll even see somebody with a neutral expression and immediately conclude that that person is highly critical and is about to be very insulting. When in fact, that person may have nothing of the kind in mind, but may be preoccupied with something that he has to do later in the day or that happened at home, and that just gets misread by this person. So when that emotion center gets turned on, it's like the motor in the car running hot, and the second hit is that the brakes don't work. Ordinarily, when we feel emotional or when we feel an impulse to do something, we can then, we call down-regulate that. We can think about it. We can say, okay, I'm not going to send that angry, furious email that I really mean it until tomorrow because I set a rule for myself, never send an email when you're angry. That's good advice, I think, by the way. And you can do that. But somebody with this condition can't. So the distress churn is really intense. And these patients don't know how to turn it off. So what they do sometimes is that they behave in a way that we think is kind of horrifying. They will injure themselves. They'll sometimes cut themselves or burn themselves, which we think ought to be terribly painful. Turns out for them, it's usually not painful. It's something that produces relief. It kind of turns off that intense emotion. And what we try to do is then help people learn better, less self-injurious ways to get relief, to distract themselves, to redirect themselves, and to go into better avenues. So that's something that characterizes. Now, the question about what's the extreme of this kind of behavior that is injurious to the self, sometimes that doesn't suffice, and sometimes they will, in fact, die by suicide. Actually, about 10% of patients with this condition have been shown to die by suicide. And when that's the case, or when it's something that is about to happen, it's not going to help to say, you have a lot of wonderful things in your family, you have a lot of uh, good things to live for. That is not reassuring, because these people feel so distressed that suicide itself seems like the only solution. So it's an attempt to solve and turn off the state of distress. And one has to try to know that and understand it and in some ways validate it and say, God, I am trying to imagine how desperate you must be feeling if I were in your shoes and I felt that way. And I can see that just trying to 
turn the world off it might feel like the only way to go. So that's a little bit about what some of the struggles are that these people have. Borderline personality disorder and bipolar disorder often have similar symptoms, but how are they differentiated? That's a good question. They do seem to be somewhat similar. Uh, There's also something called bipolar 2, which is a slight variation on bipolar disorder. And you can think about them sort of similar because they both have mood pathology. Bipolar disorder is a type of disorder that's characterized by periods of sort of emotional stability alternating with either a manic episode or a major depressive episode. And there's no sort of set pattern as to how often that will happen, which one will suddenly appear. But there are criteria in the diagnostic manual that are developed based on working with patients with this condition. So, and that's why it's called bipolar. The two poles are the manic extreme behavior in sort of hyperactive behavior and the depressive, serious, almost paralyzed inability to function of the depression. And if you have a manic episode, it's defined by the definitions in the book. It needs to be pretty persistent and really flagrant for at least a solid week, pretty much nonstop. And often it's much more than that. But then eventually, either because you can get some medication and help people, there can be a settling down to the baseline. But then there may be a dip in the other direction in the onset of a major depressive disorder where one is increasingly despondent, totally opposite from that manic top of the world, almost out of reality, behavior and thinking and feeling to feeling like you're a complete failure, life isn't worth living, you may even start to think about suicide. And this persistent extreme state of distress needs to be pretty persistent over at least two weeks. So you'll have these cycles Now, borderline doesn't look like that. Borderline has what we call emotion dysregulation. You can think of it, many people have things called cardiac arrhythmias. I sometimes refer to emotion dysregulation as emotion dysrhythmias, which is, as I said, anything can set somebody off, but also any little thing can be overreacted to. A little kind word or a compliment can lead these people to become almost euphoric and misread this as a statement of enormous admiration or that they've really found a new friend that will be for a lifetime. And so there can be just hard to anticipate, hard to predict, rapidly changing moods. And so that's the emotion dysregulation. We've even done studies called ecological momentary assessment, where people take a device and get a random query about what their mood is at that moment. And this will be something that's done on a systematic basis over several weeks. And they report emotions that are all over the map. So it's emotion dysregulation in a very unpredictable, except that it is dysregulated. And that's very different from the persistent, really extreme states that you see in bipolar disorder. What causes a person to have a personality disorder? Well, it's back to what I said before, the biopsychosocial model. Sometimes it's referred to also as the stress vulnerability model. And so we all have risk factors for various conditions. Personality disorders are no exception. So that surprises people sometimes, but these are brain disorders and one has a certain degree of heritable risk to develop them. Pretty much in the same ballpark as things like breast cancer, normal personality types, and other conditions. So there's a risk factor. And then if you're lucky and you have a really smooth, sailing, supportive, developmental life set of experiences and supportive family, it may never show up. On the other hand, if you have neglect, if you have what we call an invalidating environment, which is inconsistent and confusing, or if you're the subject of severe trauma, and we know that happens, even physical or sexual trauma, this can destabilize and derail and turn the switch on for that risk factor to develop this condition. And then it gets worse because you can never quite have the experience you need to have to stabilize because you don't have, let's say, an adult figure who can be trusted and you're constantly having the rug pulled out from under you, and that just reinforces the destabilized, very shaky identity in these people. What should a parent do if they are noticing some of these personality traits in their children? The first thing to do is to be well-informed. 
and to understand that not everything that happens developmentally is a typical function of a certain stage of development. If you think about adolescence, that's often a turbulent time, but it's not always. But it's a time when people will be prone to say, well, my kid is just a wild one. I really got about he'll grow out of it or she'll grow out of it. And that may be the case. But if you're seeing extreme behavior, which includes some really dark and scary or withdrawal and mood changes, and if you're seeing some isolation and inability to relate to people, then understand that it could be the early development of these personality traits that are not going to work well for your child. And the thing to do then is to go and see somebody in the professional world who can help you sort it out and try and understand if this could be the early presentation of what will develop into a personality disorder. Because the sooner you can recognize that, the greater your chance to really devise a way to support the child or the adolescent and steer them into a better likelihood of not developing the personality disorder. These are conditions that are very well understood now, and that means we have treatments that have been developed, and the treatments can be quite effective. And the main treatment for these conditions is psychotherapy. There are lots of types that have been demonstrated now. And to add on to what you're saying, some of these behaviors that may not feel good to the person experiencing them, like the manipulative, aggressive, or grandiose behaviors, are actually sometimes adaptive for these people who are suffering with a very invalidating environment. Like you mentioned before, the invalidating environment can actually cause some of these symptoms. And then we can have, if we look at it that way, we can have compassion for for some of, of these individuals. That's a really important point, and I I really try to get this point across to families because so often these are patients who don't see themselves as the problem. So they will blame other people. They'll be oppositional. They'll be critical. They'll be attacking. They'll say, there's nothing wrong with me. If you didn't treat me the way you did, nothing would be a problem. So it's called an externalizing type of attitude. But what you need to understand is this is not just willful oppositionalism or willful disagreeableness. These are patients in internal turmoil. This is illness-driven behavior. And you have to understand and not take it personally. Understand that it comes from this illness that is real and that these patients who are behaving in this way can't turn it off. They can't help it. And it helps you have compassion, not take it personally, and then try to be as supportive as you can be understanding it that way. So why is early intervention so critical when treating personality disorders? And can you tell us a little bit about how the new Personality Self-Portrait 25 helps with early intervention? Thank you for asking that, Bridget. So the new Personality Self-Portrait 25 is a work that actually has been around for a long time. Many years ago, I was lucky to team up with a very talented journalist and medical writer. And we wrote a book for the general public because we felt that it was important to help people understand and get interested in and curious about personality types, not necessarily starting at the point where there's already a disorder, but starting earlier on and helping people want to know what are their particular traits that are characteristic of them, which ones are not so characteristic. So we wrote a book called The Personality Self-Portrait, and then the second edition is called The New Personality Self-Portrait. And this was a book to do just that. And I had written a self-assessment test that's in the books, which you can take and then score yourself to show which personality styles are characteristic of you and which styles are not so characteristic. And this was derived from the work that I had done with others at Cornell in developing a diagnostic interview to be used in personality disorder research. In essence, what I did was conceptually turn the volume down of each of the designated disorders until it became a non-pathological, very healthy and adaptive style. So take a couple of examples. One personality disorder in the book is called narcissistic personality disorder. And you already know because it's so well known what the typical characteristics here. But it's someone who becomes very, very self-inflated and believes almost a grandiose way that they are very special, anointed in the world, and that whatever they say is correct, anybody who disagrees with them is wrong, and that they are very, very important. And that then eventually backfires and just doesn't work. If you turn the volume down, we called it self-confident personality style. And that's good. If you have a good amount of self-confidence, it really helps you succeed in the world. But then picture what it's like if that self-confidence gets louder and louder and louder until it becomes 
disconnection with reality, a belief that people feel privileged to be in your presence, having no interest in somebody if they have a difference of opinion from yours because yours is always the right one, and you get into the narcissistic realm. For Borderline, we turned the volume down and called it Mercurial, which is somebody who is spontaneous, a lot of fun, can act on impulse but not in a destructive way, and can be very entertaining and socially active. And that's something that can work very well, but it's very different from others. So there's a range of styles. One thing, just to add quickly, a few years ago with a good colleague, Alok Madan, who is a research and clinical psychologist, uh, Lois Morris, the journalist, and I teamed up with him. And we put the self-assessment test, uh, computer scored version, on the web just to see what would happen. And a couple of years later, over 12,000 people had taken it worldwide to our amazement. That gave us an international norm. So we were able to then do a new version of the web. And the new version has interpretation guide. After you take the test, it will give you your profile, your self-portrait, and then enable you to compare on each of your personality styles how you compare with 12,000 people in the world and the average score they had on that same point. So it's a very interesting way to think about what are my really strong styles that characterize me? How do I line up compared to the average people in the world, or the average of people in the world? And what am I not so strong in? For example, I'm surprised to see that my self-confidence is way lower than I realized. Maybe that's something I can work on. And maybe that's something I need somebody to complete me who is self-confident as a partner. So there are all kinds of very interesting discussions on that website that are linked to the book itself, which is still available and in print. Why is it important that clinicians who are treating individuals with personality disorders have formal training in this complex disorder before they work in the field? And I'm thinking about borderline personality disorder and DBT. And I'm also thinking about narcissistic personality disorder. And I'm really wondering what is the best treatment for that disorder? Because if I had a, somebody with a severe narcissistic personality disorder, I would be referring them to a specialist myself as a clinician. But why is that so important? Because these are very challenging conditions. Number one, because they're so disabling. Number two, because the person who has the disorder, as I had said before, often doesn't admit it, doesn't even believe it, and then isn't going to agree with you if you say, you're really out of control, you really need to get some help. They say, no, I don't. You're the one who needs to go get some help. Uh, you go first. And they're constantly sort of blaming and challenging and argumentative and sometimes even called the help-rejecting complainers who say, I'm feeling terrible, and then you suggest something, and they say, I won't do it. That's ridiculous. I don't need that. And that's a pattern that happens a lot. So you need to understand the origin and the nature of these illnesses and the phenomenology, and you need to then know the bones of what have been developed as major treatment strategies that are effective, and you have to be able to be tolerant and be pretty resilient yourself, and be interested and receptive to the nature of these people. And it does pay off. You don't always succeed in keeping a patient with borderline or narcissistic pathology in treatment because they fire their friends, they fire their families, and they fire their therapists. But if you can do the best you can and retain the person in treatment, even if they're still telling you you're a complete waste of time, it's amazing how much better they can get over time because you have become perhaps the first person they've learned to trust and believe in after they've tested you all over the map. And I think having the NPSP25, doing it at home, we, we know that assessment is so important. But for somebody with a personality disorder who may have a lot of shame, who may have a lot of fear of going to a therapist, being able to do this assessment at home is a very powerful tool. And then they can have a little bit more insight and perhaps feel more comfortable seeking treatment. I think that's what's so powerful about your tool, don't you think? 
I do. And I think that's really sort of we managed to, because I think the proof is in how successfully this has been enduring over time, because we struck a chord that we wanted to, which was to get people interested in their personality types, but also to understand that if personality traits become extremes, you can do something about it, just like you can do something about high blood pressure. But the first thing is just to understand who you are. And people have been very interested in that. And they don't get scared off. It doesn't pathologize things. The front door is to talk about interesting, wonderfully colorful differences among people between you and your loved ones and your friends. Sometimes people have a group of people will take the test. And there's even a way on the website you can superimpose your self-portrait with somebody else's self-portrait and see exactly how you're alike and how you're different. Can you talk a little bit about narcissism or narcissistic personality disorder? We're hearing it it a lot in the news, but I was told that a lot of people who experience narcissistic personality disorder may have a lot of shame or a lot of trauma or some, again, invalidating environment, and they need compassion as well. Oh, absolutely. But I would say that about all personality disorders, especially important to know that with regard to conditions like borderline, narcissistic, or even something like antisocial personality disorder. That's one we have a lot more to learn about because we don't have a good handle on how to help people. But with narcissistic personality disorder, what we know is that underneath, there's a profound fragility, inadequate or an insufficient self-esteem, a lack of self-confidence, which you wouldn't think because they're telling you that they're the most successful, important, and magnificent person on the planet. But that is such a pervasive, necessary belief system that they then have talked themselves into believing that the origins of that, what we would call character armor, the way one of the early pioneers in personality used to talk about it, is a way of protecting myself and disguising and hiding from anybody else and even from me that at core, I really am not the person I'm claiming to be. And if you can get the person to have enough recognition of that, even a little bit, to be willing to stay in treatment with you, then psychotherapy once or twice a week by somebody who's trained and understands the problem can eventually be very helpful. I've had many patients in my own practice through the years where it's been very gratifying to the patient at the other end. So what are you most excited about in mental health treatment today? We're in a real bonanza of neuroscience right now. We're learning more and more. The brain isn't a black box at all anymore. Our new technology with brain imaging, but also with genetics and genomics and even the sort of interventions using nanotechnology are just fabulous. I joke about it sometimes because I was trained in the days when we studied Freud and we had the whole theories about unconsciously motivated behavior. And that was our understanding about things we did that we didn't know why we were doing them. And sometimes in psychoanalysis or psychotherapy, it helped you figure that out. What's amusing to me now is that neuroscientists are studying the neurobiological basis of the unconscious. We're coming right back around with technology that enables us to understand that, and yes, there are things going on that are brain-driven, that are cellularly driven, that are genetically driven, that lead us to, in fact, have a level of brain functioning that we couldn't tell you about if asked, but that we're beginning to understand are going on under the surface or sort of behind the curtain. So all of that is really exploding, and I think it's just going to be wonderful to follow. If you had a magic wand and could improve one thing about mental health treatment today, what would it be? That's an easy answer, and it's not something we've talked about a lot or referred to, sort of, but it's the problem of stigma. There's an enormous stigma that is so persistent and so difficult to get beyond. Mental illness carries with it the sense of weakness, a sense of shame. It's something you don't want to acknowledge, you don't want to let people know about, and there are a lot of reasons for that, but it goes all the way back to the early colonial days or beyond with this sense of somehow being demonically possessed that then transforms into a sense of just being inadequate and a weakling and not able to get your shit together and man up or woman up and get going in a good direction and don't come whining to me that you can't do it. I'm just paraphrasing the way people will think. They won't necessarily say that, but it's in fact something that's very pervasive. It's not as bad. It's getting better. Depression is coming out of the closet a fair amount. It's a brain disease. It's not a weakness. 
bipolar disorder a little bit, anxiety disorders a little bit, even some, certainly alcoholism, a little bit with substance use, hardline substance abuse is not understood or accepted yet. And the major psychotic conditions, except for bipolar, and that's becoming understood, I think, a little bit better. But still, there's this halo of the uneasiness, discomfort, a sense that this is a whole different ballgame than going in because you're short of breath and having an allergic reaction or going in because you've got arthritis. So how can my audience learn more about your work, either online or in print? The book is still in print. It's not pricey. Get it in paperback on Amazon for like nine bucks. It's called The New Personality Self-Portrait. But the main thing is just go to the website, which is www.npsp25.com. And there's a lot of information on the website that you can, I think, find interesting about all kinds of things that we've been talking about. And then if you want to, it costs 18 bucks to take the test. We don't make any money on it. We just don't even cover our costs. In order to make it a good, uh, informative website, we need to have a little bit return. But if you want to, you can take the test, and then you'll get a whole interpretation guide that will help you think about who you are and what your particular traits are that are most prominent, that characterize you, and also what are the ones that aren't, and that may or may not match what you think, or it sometimes has surprises. So Dr. Olden, on behalf of myself, my listeners, and all of the people that you've helped through your work, I want to thank you for your contributions to mental health treatment and for taking the time out of your busy schedule to help me and my audience better understand the field of personality disorders. Well, thank you, Bridget. It's been a pleasure to talk to you, and I hope this has been information that people will find informative and useful. So be sure to check out my website, therapyshow.com, which has many resources about mental health, including a page dedicated to your work. There you will also find how to submit questions, stories, or insights that you have about the mental health system or suggestions about who else I can interview and how I can improve the show. So I'd like to close by reminding our listeners to please subscribe, share, and review this podcast so that you, someone you love, and people around the world can gain more benefit from therapy. There is no need to suffer in silence. Get the help that you need to create the life that you want.